I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, we're continuing our Just Jesus series. And uh, we're going to be in Luke 13 and Luke 14 today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1037 and you will find Luke chapter 13 there. And, and of course, as always, if you need a Bible, uh, you want to read God's Word and you don't have a Bible, then please take one of those. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, be able to read God's Word because we know it will change your life. Hey, uh, before we dive into the text, uh, let me just share uh, one really cool thing with you that I'm excited about and I hope you'll be excited about. Next November, November 2017, we're taking a group to the Holy Land. And if you've ever dreamed of going, if you've, you know, it's on your bucket list and you want to walk where Jesus walked and, and you want to see the sights and just let the, the scriptures come alive like never before, then uh, I'm just going to invite you to check it out. You can do that one of two ways. Stop by the main lobby connection center after the service. They've got some brochures there. Uh, and uh, if that doesn't work for you, then just email me and uh, we'd be glad to talk about it and share with you some of the information. It, it is an exciting trip and it is an educational trip. It's a trip that will help you draw closer to Christ and increase your faith. So if that's something you want to do, I just want you to check it out because I want all of you to go. Uh, no, it's not going to happen, but it'd be really cool if it did. Uh, so, I, although someone have to stay here and do church, right? <laughs> hey, how many of you basically are kind of wired that you keep the rules? You're just a, somebody who naturally just kind of keeps the rules, and you do that. Okay, lots of hands go up like that. How, how many of you are the opposite? How many of you are the rule breakers? Yeah, a lot of you. How many of you are, are rule breakers married to rule keepers? Uh, yeah, we have, that's why we have marriage counseling available. Uh, you know, rules have a purpose. Uh, they always have a purpose, but they quickly get out of hand because the people who like rules tend to be the people who make rules, and they tend to go overboard. Uh, like, for instance, you know, safety rules. You know, let's just go with that. Uh, uh, seat belts are an awesome idea. You know, seat belts, airbags, all that kind of stuff is great. A lot of us grew up with this being a seat belt. Uh, not really safe. You know, some of us survived the years of, you know, being a safe parent is not letting your children stand on the front seat while you're driving. Uh, you know, infant car seats are a beautiful thing. They're a wonderful thing because a lot of, uh, there's a lot of moms in here that probably took their kids home on their lap. Uh, there's a lot of you that survived being taken home on somebody's lap before car seats were. So those are awesome ideas. But on the other hand, laws mandating child safety seats until they're about 37 are not a good idea. You know, they just go too far. You know, it's always, oh, we need more, we need more, we need more. You know, I grew up without bike helmets uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and sometimes you, that's why I, I am the way I am. And, uh, but, you know, a, lot, a whole generation of us grew up without bike helmets, without elbow pads, without knee pads. Some of you have uh, taken your kids to the emergency room because they didn't have elbow pads and knee pads. And so now it's great. Kids are wearing those things, and, and it protects them a whole bunch, and, and that's awesome because they're doing all those extreme sports. But... Uh, on the other hand, calling Child Protective Services because a couple of kids are walking home from a park alone is overboard. It's overboard. So, so the rules are good, but they, they sometimes go too far. It's kind of a natural progression. And, and I'll just confess, I don't like rules, okay? I'm a natural rules breaker. Uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with God's rules. That's why we read this book, because he tells us how to live. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. But... Uh, uh, but God's rules are okay, everybody else's. I'm going to question. I'm going to ask why. What's the point of that rule? And I share that, and this is the dilemma that I faced. I did youth ministry for 10 years. I worked with teenagers. I took them on trips. And if you're going to take kids on trips, you've got to have rules. So I, I tried to figure it out. How does somebody who hates rules got to come up with rules? So I came up with three rules. Here are my rules. You can try them out. Maybe your kids will like them too. Uh, but rule number one for me, and by the way, I would sit down with the kids before we leave, and I'd make them memorize the rules and tell them back to me. Okay? That's how serious I was about my three rules. Rule number one was have fun. That's a tough rule, isn't it? Have a good time because we're not going to camp for you to be, you know, uh, depressed. We're not going on a mission trip for you to have an awful time. We're not going to Six Flags for you to be in tears, okay? Might happen, but if you are, we're going to talk about it because you're breaking the rule. Have fun. No one ever protested rule number one. Rule number two, a little different story. Rule number two is this. Don't do anything stupid, okay? Don't do anything stupid. If you're not sure it's stupid, don't do it. 
If you think you don't want your parents to find out about it, it's definitely stupid. Don't do it. Uh, just don't do anything stupid. Lots of kids broke rule number two. Rule number three really could have belonged in rule number two. It's just for emphasis. Don't touch my stuff. Okay? My underwear is not going up the flagpole. My bed is not getting sabotaged because I do not want to send you home because that will break rule number one. So uh, that, those are my rules, and, and it worked for me. And I share that because today we're looking at two rules-related stories. Uh, they're stories of Jesus breaking the rules. Not God's rules, but man's stupid rules. So uh, let's look at the story. The story. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 10, is the first one I want us to look at. We're going to actually look at two passages that are really close to each other. It says, Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Kind of like the baptism thing over here. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant, angry because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman be a daughter of of Abraham whom Satan bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by Jesus. Turn one page over to Luke 14. One page, if you've got a Bible like mine, it's one page. Verse 1. One Sabbath, you see a theme here, right? One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. See, the Pharisees were the rule keepers extraordinaire. They loved the rules. They devoted themselves to learning and living God's law. Problem was, it quickly got out of hand. It quickly became a rules-based religion. And they equated keeping the rules with being righteous. Okay? So their, their thinking was, okay, if we keep the rules, then I'm a righteous person, I'm a good person, and then God will be happy with me. And they lived their life to keep the rules, thinking that God was going to be happy with them. But was God happy with them because they kept the rules? No, he wasn't, because God was standing there in their midst. Jesus, who's God in the flesh, God incarnate, was standing there, and he was disgusted at their application of keeping the rules. In fact, Jesus destroyed their rules, not his rules, their rules. You see, the Pharisees tried to follow 613 laws. God gave 10, and he summarized those in two. Okay? 613 laws. What the Pharisees did is they went through the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and they took everything that said, do this, don't do this, kind of do this, and, and, and they said, these are the 613 laws that we're going to follow. Okay? I could hardly get teenagers to learn three. And one of those was have fun. And they've got 613 laws. And and, and every one of those had subcategories about how to apply it to their lives. I mean, that is crazy. How in the world do they expect anybody to do that? They really don't. They just want to sit there and, and, you know, make fun of you when you break the rules. So, for instance, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's one of God's big ten, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. This is the one that Jesus kind of challenged how they apply the rule. Here's how it worked. God gave that command, remember the Sabbath. Basically, God is saying, guys, I'm going to bless you by giving you the Sabbath because I don't want you to all become a bunch of workaholics. Oh, some of us need to repent right now. And uh, he's like, I want you to work six days, take one day off, and rest. Rest. And on that day that you rest, you're honoring me because you're remembering that I am the one who loves you and I'm the one who provides for you. 
So that's the purpose of the Sabbath. God gave us the Sabbath to bless us, not to make us prisoners to the rules. But um, the Pharisees didn't see it that way. See, the Pharisees said, okay, they got this whole, you don't work on the Sabbath, so let me explain to you what work is. And they had 39 categories to explain what work is. 39 categories. And every one of those had subcategories of, of how to not work. Can I just tell you something? No one has ever had to explain to me how not to work. It just comes naturally to me. I know when I'm working, and I know when I'm not working. And yet the Pharisees had to say, hey, you know, we got to explain to you 39 different ways to not work. Okay, this is how ridiculous it is today. Because the Orthodox Jews, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Hasidic Jews, still are trying to live it out like the Pharisees did. And they have a great impact on Israel. And if you go with us next year on the Holy Land trip, you're going to see this. Because when you're in Israel on the Sabbath, everything shuts down. Because even though they're a small part of the population, they, they, everything's kind of geared for the, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Pharisees of today, and, uh, and they don't work. And so a lot of them go to hotels, uh, so the people of the hotel will take care of them, and uh, they don't have to work. And so in the hotels and in lots of buildings around Israel, they have what is called a Sabbath elevator. A Sabbath elevator. And that means that on the Sabbath, it does something really different. Uh, it does this. You get on the Sabbath elevator when it opens up. You don't push any buttons. Uh, and the elevator will go up one floor and open. And then it'll close. It'll go up one floor and then open. And then close. And, it'll go up, and it just does that up and down all day long. Why do they do that? Because someone decided that it is work to do this. Pushing a button constitutes work, so they can't push a button on an elevator. Uh, by the way, if you've got kids, that is not work, because kids do what to the elevator? They've got to run to the elevator because they want to push the... It's fun to push the button. Don't just let them push all the buttons, you know. It's fun to push the button. Look, I never got excited running to clean the bathroom. I never said, oh, I've got to go do the dishes right now, yay! No, that because it's work. But no, they can't push the button. That's what rules kind of do, and, and 39 categories to define what work is and is not. And by the way, that is not God. Okay, God gave us 10 big commands, right? I'm the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt, set you free from slavery, have no other gods before me. Don't make any graven images or idols. Don't take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet why? Because he wants to keep us out of the ditch of life. He wants to keep us from crashing our lives. These are the boundaries to protect us from our self-destructive impulses. And then God summarized those in two. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said this, All the law and the prophets hang on these two, depend on these two, are summarized by these two. He said, I want you to get this. Th these two define all the rest, because if you're loving God, you're going to keep these. If you're loving people, you're going to keep these. You see, Jesus gave the law to Israel and to us to prepare us for grace, to demonstrate that no one is good or righteous by keeping the law, because we're all lawbreakers by nature. In other words, we all need a Savior. And Jesus came to be the one who could atone for our sins. And the Pharisees accused the lawgiver of being the lawbreaker. You see, Jesus wants every one of us to experience forgiveness and mercy and grace and love through a life-changing relationship with him. In other words, if you want to know God, it's not about the rules. It's about relationship. Have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and that he was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Look, if you're just sitting here and trying to be religious and trying to be good and hoping that you're going to be good enough, you're missing the point. It's not about being good enough. It is about having a relationship with the Son of God who loves you and gave himself up for you. And if you haven't taken that step, if you don't know that you have that experience, that life-changing relationship with Jesus, then, then right now, just tune me out and just say, God, I need you to change my life. I surrender to you. 
I surrender it to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I, I need forgiveness. And let God change your life. You don't have to wait till the end of the service. You can start right now. That's the story. Let's talk about the application. What do these stories mean? Why, why is the gospel filled with these accounts of Jesus healing on the Sabbath? What does he want us to get? First of all, I think he wants us to understand that compassion trumps religious rules. Compassion trumps religious rules. Um, the rules said you don't work on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees defined healing as work on the Sabbath. And, and so the Pharisees protested that Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. See, Jesus said, I know what your rules are, but I'm going to show compassion to people who are hurting and broken on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees got mad. The one got indignant. How dare you let these people come on the other six days of the week when, when you can heal? Yeah, but Jesus wasn't there the other six days of the week. Kind of a problem. You know, he didn't post his schedule online so he could show up where he was going to be and know that Jesus is going to be here at this time. And so in that moment, in that day, this woman who is broken and who's been tormented for 18 years, Jesus is there and he has compassion and he heals her and the rules people got upset. Let me be really blunt. Sometimes churches can be mean to people. People come to church, they're hurting, they're broken, they're in despair, they want hope, they want help, and instead they get met with accusation and judgment. Because you're not keeping the rules. Please know this. God is not impressed if you keep the rules and treat people like garbage. God is not impressed if you keep all the rules and you treat people like garbage. Because what are the two rules that everything else depends on? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. As yourself. Yeah, so, so how do you treat people like garbage to try to represent Jesus? It doesn't work. And we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Jesus showed compassion. I want Calvary to be a place of compassion. Uh, you know, look, we know God's commands. We're going to endeavor to live them. We want you to learn them. That's why we give away Bibles. Uh, we're not going to compromise those, but we know that people are hurting, and we want to offer healing and hope. And we understand that compassion always trumps religious rules. Second thing, people are more important than piety. Piety is just a fancy word for uh, trying to live a holy life. You know, Scripture says, be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. So God wants us to live holy lives. He calls us to live holy lives. Holy means being different like God is different. And that is a great thing to aspire to. We all, as followers of Christ, we all ought to aspire to living a holy life. But here's the problem. The problem is how we define this. Because churches usually define holy as two things. They say you're holy if you engage in personal spiritual discipline. So you, you read the Bible, you pray, uh, you attend church, you give. You do those things that are, are personal that you've got to decide to do. And by the way, all those things are good. And all those things are affirmed in Scripture. Uh, so there's not a problem with that. The second part of it, though, is because then they define holy as what you don't do. All the stuff that you don't do with your life, that's what makes you holy, right? So you, you go, okay, I'm gonna, I, I, don't, I don't drink, I don't dance, I don't go to movies, I, I, uh, I don't do all the stuff. By the way, what were all the crazy things your churches didn't want you to do? What were all the stuff that, you know, I'm talking about extra biblical things. What were the stuff that, that you weren't allowed to do growing up because somebody said you can't go, do it? You go to movies, okay, you can't go to movies. How many of you had a, a dress code? Okay, how many of you ladies couldn't wear pants to, to church? You had, okay, so a lot, of you, a lot of you had that. Yeah, I got rebuked one time. I, it was, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, summertime, 115 degrees. I wore shorts to Sunday night church. Nobody shows up for Sunday night church. Yeah, I got in trouble for that. So, uh, you know, it's just crazy. All these different rules that are applied. You know, you got, oh, you got to do this. So if you don't do that, you got to abstain from this. You got to stay this way. Um, Jesus made it really clear. Holiness is not only having those personal disciplines, but it's loving like God loves. It's seeing people as God's creation. It's caring for people as, as family. It's nurturing and teaching and encouraging and helping people along on the journey. See, see that's what's really important to Jesus. 
uh, I was in my late teens. Uh, uh, you know, I grew up in church. I was going to church. I actually liked going to church. I loved God. I was committed to ministry. I was studying the Bible. I was reading. I was doing all this kind of stuff. And, and, and I got told that I wasn't a good Christian because of my entertainment choice. Um, now, some of you are thinking, what, were you hanging out in strip clubs? You getting partying on the weekends? You know, no, it wasn't anything like that. Um, brace yourselves. I played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> See, and some of you are laughing going, I knew you were a nerd. <laughs> yes, I, I was. And some of you are going, what the heck is that? Okay, if you don't know what that is, then just imagine your grandkids' video games, all, all the role-playing ones, and then just take away the technology. That's it. That's what Dungeons and Dragons was. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I was a nerd. And, and here's the thing. They're telling me, you, you're not a good Christian because you do that. Real Christians don't play these demonic games. Uh, and the truth was, I read the Bible. I didn't say anything about playing Dungeons and Dragons. I really didn't. It did say some stuff about the way that you loved your wife or the way you love your kids or the way you love your neighbor or the way you serve people and, and cared for people. And so people were, were worried about making up these rules because they wanted to be pious, and God is more interested in people falling in love with Jesus. So if you're more focused on what you abstain from than how you love people, you might be caught up in the rules-based religion. Third application. Rules promote conformity. The Holy Spirit changes lives. We all know the saying, birds of a feather... Yeah, flock together. If you got that wrong, then see me afterwards. Uh, need to read more. But we, we, it's natural for us to want our groups to conform, right? You hang out with people who like the same stuff that you like, so you can go to the same movies, play the same games, enjoy that kind of stuff. We like hanging out with people that agree with our opinions mostly, you know, politics and, and, and things like that. We, we don't want to get in fights every time we're having dinner. Uh, we like people who, who kind of see the world or express patriotism the way that we do. And, and the temptation is for churches to want people to conform. So if you're a good Christian, you dress a certain way, you talk a certain way, you behave appropriately, you wear your hair appropriately, and who decides appropriate? Because the gospel is wonderfully vague. You know what the Bible says about how you dress in your appearance? Modest. What does that mean? Well, that means something different in every single culture that there is, and, and what happens is we decide that we're going to be the rule makers and interpret for God to everyone else, and that's not God. You know what the biblical way to, to do this is? It, it's not about trying to get people to conform to what you look like or how you think and stuff like that. It is about introducing people to Jesus and then allowing Jesus to change their lives. See, that, that's why we want to introduce people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because we know that Jesus will change your lives. Because what happens when you confess Christ as Lord, God the Holy Spirit inhabits your life. He takes over your life. That's what he does. And he's there. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who will comfort us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will convict us of sin. Guess what? It's not my job to tell you what you're doing wrong with your life. Here's what I know. If you're a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. You know his voice because he's talking to you. You don't need me to tell you what's wrong. He's the one who's going to tell you what's wrong with your life. And I can say all kinds of stuff up here, and, and the Holy Spirit will take one little piece of it, and he will penetrate your heart with that and go, hey, knock it off. And we know that. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. You may try to drown him out sometimes. You may try to tune him in sometimes. But he is there, and he is going to lead you to life. And the temptation that we have as churches is to try to tell people that, well, God's going to change your life, and as soon as you walk in the door, we give you a list of rules on how to do it. In other words, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, we sing beautiful songs about the Holy Spirit, and then we try to be the Holy Spirit. And it's a tragedy. Because people come in and they've discovered Jesus and they love Jesus and he's awesome, and then we ruin it for them because we try to get them to be like us. Instead, we're going to trust the Holy Spirit to change your life. Which means here at Calvary, we're going we're to encourage freedom. Freedom. Freedom's kind of scary, isn't it? We're going to resist the urge to create rules. We're going to resist the urge to try and control people. 
My favorite Catholic author, his name's uh, Henry Nouwen, in his book, uh, In the Name of Jesus, says it's easier to control people than to love people. Think about that. It's easier to control people than to love people. Rules are all about trying to control people, trying to control their behavior, trying to control what they do. And, and, and you know what I've found? They don't work. See, if, if you tell me I have to act a certain way, have to be a certain way, that's external motivation. It's not going to work except when you're there. Because if you're there, I might kind of conform, and then when you leave, I'll do what I want. Isn't that what you guys do? But see, internal motivation, when the Holy Spirit convicts me to live a certain way, to do a certain thing, nobody has to be there. Nobody has to encourage me. I'm going to do it because I'm following God and because I know God's going to lead me to life. And that's amazing because now I'm obedient to God because I want to be, because I love Jesus. And some may protest in their mind, but if you tell people that they can sin and, and, and do that, if they, they don't have to follow the rules, they're going to sin all they want to, and it's going to be terrible, it's going to be chaos. And you know what I discovered? It doesn't matter what I tell people, they're going to sin all they want to anyway. Every single person in this room sins all they want to. The question is, do you want to embrace more destruction, or do you want to embrace the life that Jesus offers? See, most of us in this room want life we're tired of the destruction we're tired of the pain we're we're tired uh, of our life just being uh broken to pieces we want god to heal it it's just easier to control people though than to love people but what does god want us to do what does god want us to do love yeah he wants us to love and that means that we need to be patient because love is patient and love is kind the Holy Spirit works over time. And see, churches, we get impatient and we say, you need to change right now, and here's the way you need to change right now. That's not how God works. Holy Spirit has been changing me for 46 years, and I'm still a mess. Reality is we're all a mess. And yet God loves us and the Holy Spirit inside of us is healing us and teaching us and leading us and convicting us. And if we listen to him and if we follow him, our life is going to grow and, and we're going to fall in love with Jesus all the more. See, that's what makes a difference. It's the love of Christ that compels us to follow. So I believe God's going to change you in his time. And I'm going to teach you and I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to be the biggest cheerleader for you as you follow Jesus Christ. But today, are you following Jesus or are you following the rules? Because only one truly leads to life. I pray that you're finding freedom in following Christ. Let's pray.